Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. I hope you guys are doing well today. And we have some intense weather in the southeast going on. And so we see severe storms could bring damaging winds to the southeast as well as lightning and isolated flooding possible as well. And they cannot rule out a tornado threat. And again, we have seen a lot of damaging storms across the globe. And we should be as prepared as we can as we go deeper and deeper into this cycle. So the other thing that's possible here is a derecho. And this severe weather also satisfied a criteria for what meteorologists call a derecho. A derecho is a line of thunderstorms that produce a concentrated area of wind damage or severe thunderstorm winds for a distance of 250 miles or more. And you could see here the uh, storms that were reported for the past 24 hours. So again, people, my friends out there, be as prepared as possible. And we see here, we have a government panel warning that a magnitude nine quake, tsunami as high as almost 100 feet could strike Northern Japan. And as we know, Ring of Fire is most definitely an area where you could have these type of events. And of course, that would be a great quake. And so a tsunami up to 98 feet hit, could hit Hokkaido in northern Japan and also Iwate in the northeast if a magnitude 9 quake occurs off the Pacific coast. And of course we all know about Fukushima and what that has done to the environment. And uh, we're going to be looking at some other signs of you know exactly just how, how everything has gone so wrong in this... Um, well, in the culture that we have and with the powers that be, you know, not really paying attention to the earth at all. So based on a worst case scenario, they added that a mega quake centered around the Jap Japan Trench and the Kuril Trench could be imminent. And this right off the bat gets me thinking, and there is a, a little video down here that shows what would happen. And this is from Noah, and we could play that. And you could see that as it occurs, then it sort of emanates outwards and it would end up encompassing the entire, as we shift forward, Pacific Basin, you know, impacting the West Coast, going down through Central America, and eventually also impacting the West Coast of South America. And I think a lot of you guys probably picked up what I was thinking about as we're looking at this. And that's exactly the fact that uh, in 1700, uh, we had that kind of uh, situation occur over in Cascadia. So, you know, the great uh, Cascadian quake of 1700, that was a mega thrust earthquake and the tsunami. So it was on the opposite coast and emanating outwards. And uh, this was something, you know, this was a, a, a huge event. By most accounts, it was a dark and stormy night when Thunderbird and Whale fought their cataclysmic battle. Darkness comes early in the Pacific Northwest in January. The sun had been down for hours and dark and cold. No one could see Thunderbird swoop down, but they felt it when she grabbed Whale in her talons and rose up with it, and then she dropped Whale from a great height, slamming it to the ground. The land shook and the waters receded. And that's, that's always a sign to be... <laughs> Be alert and to get away from the coast. Some people knew to get into the canoes, and they're telling this from a Native American perspective, uh, as you could tell. Some didn't have time. And then came the Great Flood, which destroyed whole villages and left many canoes stranded in trees. That's one version of what happened that night. There are many tales, obviously. So this was something that was probably around a 9.0. And so this was a major, major event. And also, this is basically pretty due to occur again. And as we know, this is one of the number one areas that we are watching on the globe for a mega quake. So researchers take the pulse of a sleeping supervolcano with magma molten for millions of years. And that's what they say. And again, their timelines, you know, sometimes we have to question and wonder. So Uppsala University researchers discovered how a supervolcano in the Andes on the border with Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia holds molten magma for millions of years without fully solidifying or erupting. And, you know, this gets you thinking about 
you know, the potential, obviously, for Yellowstone that comes to mind. We've seen a lot of quake activity over by Mammoth Lake, which is another super volcano. And when we look back at history, the last time, as we're giving you a graphic here of the, the magma that's pooled there in the continental crust coming up from the mantle, the last big super volcanic eruption uh, was about 73,000 years ago, they tell us. And that was Toba's super eruption in Indonesia. And it's considered to have almost led to the extinction of mankind. And they are that powerful, these, these events. And it would not be a good scenario if uh, Mammoth Lake or if Yellowstone did go off. And we have a Beko volcano. And this one's spewing some ash. And this is in Paramushir Island, Russia. Aviation color code remains orange. We see a lot of them. And we're waiting for some of the more ancient ones that have not erupted in a long time to wake up. As it appears it's only a matter of time before they kick in as well. More torrential rains. And this is over in Fiji. And this is affecting an area that was already hard hit by Tropical Cyclone Herald. And there's videos and photos here as well. You know, we, we joked about this, but it's true. You know, you got boats anchored on main streets now. It's just part of the world that we live in. And we also have heavy rains triggering floods in Saudi Arabia. And we've seen this occur again and again over in the desert. We were looking at Yemen, Saudi Arabia. We were looking uh, also in northeastern Africa at ma massive floods. There's obviously a huge food shortage problem that is just building. We still have ongoing swarming going on in Idaho. And we have a lot of activity in Utah today. Uh, we've had that Salt Lake City area being pretty active. And you see there's nine quakes there today. You see some trailing off heading up towards Idaho. And then we see some going straight down through the middle as well, including, it was a cluster of five over here. Yep, still just five over here off east of Cedar in Utah. And, you know, when we look at the Earth Changes maps, it looks like there's massive changes on the West Coast. Uh, that's what has been seen by the likes of uh, Edgar Casey, Gordon Michael Scallion, and others. And we still have a lot of activity in Ridgecrest. We still have swarming going on up by Mammoth Lakes as well. And there's swarming going on by the geysers. So it's pretty active. No very large quakes out there. You know, one of the biggest ones we have is right down here, 5.4, over in Argentina. So scientists found a frog fossil in Antarctica. Now they're saying that it was about 200 million years ago. And Antarctica might have been more like a rainforest at that time. Maybe it was in a different position, you know. And uh, at one time, the whole globe was much, much warmer, much warmer. And, you know, of course, there was a lot, there wasn't any ice at all packed. Uh, and so, you know, the, the world appears, it gets remade on a regular basis. Wouldn't you say so, Cindy? I do believe it does, and I, I think it's a very dramatic yet beautiful thing. And unfortunately, more dead birds. Mm -hmm. You know, every everywhere we look, there's more dead birds. We were just talking about them on the cruise ship, you know, which we were attributing to. Uh, you you know what? We're not going to sing for you this time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we don't want to pain 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 make some pain for your ears. Yeah. Uh, thousands of seabirds wash up on Scotland beaches dead and some just emaciated. So, you know, this is the Atlantic. We were talking about Fukushima and the Pacific. You know, what's it going to take before we, we recognize that we have to treat the planet better? And uh, it, it, all they care about is their economic numbers. And it's just so sad. And again, mysterious causes. They don't, they don't know exactly what's going on. You know, it very well could be uh, wavelength energy related, uh, or it could be something else going on too. You know, it's, so much of the planet has been so poisoned by the system that we live under. And this was adorable. There's a, lit, a video here for you to look at. So they have a robotic baby chimp that's, wa uh, I should say baby gorilla, that's watching these gorillas eat. 
And these gorillas are like singing and humming while they're eating. It's just cute, isn't it? It is so cute. They're really pulley and their big bellies and they, they're just, they're adorable in, in their own place where they're at. Yeah, they're just having such a good time and they are appreciating, you know, uh, all the leaves and everything as these, you know, big, big guys here and gals, they're vegetarian. So that's what they eat, you know, is pretty much leaves and fruit. And the other thing is they're extremely gassy. So they let out some of the biggest ones you've ever heard, probably. And it's continuous. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't. I mean, look at the size of these bellies. They, they are withholding uh, so much methane. If it ever let loose at one time, we'd all be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it would be painful. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's interesting to see them sing and hum, and they're so happy. And, and we should be that way. And we would be more, I think, if we were in tune with Mother Nature like they are. So how to stop smart TVs from snooping on you? Your internet-connected smart TV can invade your privacy. Basically, it's a computer, you know, and it can be hacked. And they, you know, most of them have microphones, right? So you could be snooped on by your smart TV. Recognize that the FBI and top security experts uh, have some recommendations for you and you know it might sound like a real big pain in the butt but when not in use you might want to just unplug it uh, you know and if we we see that you know your phone can still be basically on even when you turn it off and uh, we've noticed you know because I made a point now to turn off location services and stop all the intrusion and as I said I've gotten rid of Facebook and gotten rid of LinkedIn and uh, yeah, we're going to go to just sharing a phone as well as we, we try to get to be more and more and more minimalist and get away from the tech, you know, besides what's necessary for working on clients and for uh, doing videos. Otherwise, you know, it's just we're unplugging. We're trying to unplug as much as possible. And I really do think it makes you feel better. Mm-hmm. I do, too. There's something about the frequencies that come through the phones. Um particularly with with uh, the chat I don't know there's just something something there that they've done to us and I'll never probably ever be able to pinpoint it I just it's annoying well I mean think about densities different densities different beings and it seems like perhaps this is a way that they could actually move around or utilize or something you know there's something to it there most definitely is something to it so here are uh, nine survival sk- survival skills you can learn at home or in your backyard. Knot tying, in case you guys haven't picked up any fancy knots. Slingshot making and mastering. Now, we did that as kids. That was a lot of fun. Flint napping. You know, here we find some arrowheads here and there as well. Uh, drawing drinking water as well and this uh, gets into a solar still and there's a link there as well on how to make one Uh, making a fire anywhere without necessarily matches or lighter even though I did buy like uh, 250 lighters just in case from a cheap cheap buy (laughs) you never you never could have too many you know things like that foraging for food and make sure you know what mushrooms you are picking. They could be very poisonous if you are picking mushrooms. Uh, building an outdoor shelter. Great skill to have. Basic emergency first aid. Again, that's something that really everybody should know. Trapping and fishing if you are of that mindset as well. So, you know, there's so many things we could do to hone our skills. I do truly believe that we will be facing... I feel like at around 2021, next year, towards the end of this year, we're going to probably see some isolated uh, grid going down events. And I, I just feel like it's coming. I do feel like it's coming. I think the sun will wake up again a little bit as we come out of the minimum uh, in, as far as this so- solar cycle with our shields down, you know, with the magnetosphere so low that we will be very susceptible and then of course there's always other possibilities as we know you know besides uh, CME you could have a EMP as well so as we are we're trying to harden ourselves a little bit and get used to um, you know get used to being out in the environment and when we came across country 
and we spent a lot of, well we spent uh, some time enjoying ourselves down around tombstone and all it was 100 degrees every day um, and we had no ac so you know underneath trees with a breeze it's not really that bad i you know i, I think that modern humans have gotten very soft we have and that concerns me a little bit because it's like we've gotten used to so many modern conveniences and then if we have to go without suddenly and in a sudden way that's that's really bad that could shock our systems but if we sort of kind of force us force ourselves to rough it a little bit now and just maybe turn off the power and figure stuff out now then maybe you won't have such a shock later i think it's um i think it's a good it's a good exercise mm -hmm. Definitely, because as we know, we are living in very, very unpredictable times. Guys, thank you so much for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon. You are keeping us going through the demonetization of the primary channel. And uh, you're, thank you also for your support and helping to build this second channel, uh, which as time goes on will become basically the first channel. And uh, we're going to keep switching yeah, we're going to cover all the things we cover, uh, but we'll be doing more and more on, you know, trying to show people how we are uh, living off grid and, um, you know, as much as possible and, and tiny home living, too, because I think it, uh, I think I figured it out. It's 142 square feet, I think, in the camper. So I think that would qualify as a tiny home. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like um, 19 feet by eight, you know, so. It's pretty tiny, um, but you know, hey, you spend more time outdoors as well. So guys, thank you so much for being part of our family. As always, God bless and namaste. God bless and namaste.